you come to prayer with me this morning, please? Embracing and loving God of so many names, we thank you for bringing us together this morning. We thank you for all of those who have been mothers or mother images or figures in our lives this day, or those who identify or who are mothers, be with them and continue to be with them. Bring us together as we hear the words that are spoken this morning, not only from our hearts, but from our minds, but let those be the receptors that are spoken within us. I ask you now that you touch my lips of clay and mold them into the words that need to be spoken this morning, and that the words that come from my mouth and the meditations that come from each and every one of our hearts, may they be ever acceptable to you. In Christ we pray. Amen. Well, I understand last week you got engaged with the Good Shepherd within all of your lives, and I'm actually most grateful to uh, Mark Mickelson for yet again stepping up to the plate for me and preaching while I was at the network gathering um, at MCC Detroit for three days. I must say that while I was engaged in MCC Detroit's new sermon, The Gospel According to Motown, <laughs> it's going to be an interesting series. I, 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 they kicked it off well. Um, I was anxious to get home and upload and hear Mark's sermon about the Good Shepherd. I really didn't ask around about how Mark's sermon went because I always know that he's going to do a good job. And uh, just out of cur courtesy, he always actually sends me his sermon in advance just to look at and to comment on and to do whatever. And usually there's very little comment that has to go back because it's usually in good shape for you. But, um, but what Mark doesn't do is send me, sends me, does not send me his opening jokes. I have to wait until those have to go online. So, um, however, since I had a busy week, you know, I thought I'd borrow one of his sermons this morning and preach it. But um, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> see, I actually went and listened and watched your sermon. But no, um, his sermons are all original sermons. They, I do not write his sermons for him. Um, but uh, I heard it was it was a good sermon. I got to listen to it uh, Thursday afternoon while I was here, and uh, was just grateful. So anyway, um, thank you, Mark. Thank so for those of you that were born pre-1970, and I know there's a few that are post-1970, um, may we call a story back around 1975 um, in most of the newspapers in the country, as well it was highlighted on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, if anyone remembers that, um, not once, but twice. Anyone have a clue? See, you don't even read the Friday Weekly. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I was going to say, you have to read the Friday Bulletin, huh? But there was a gentleman by the name of Gary Dahl and had this brilliant idea of wanting a pet but didn't want to get up in the middle of the night to take it out, to feed it and all that, to get it loose or to misbehave and didn't want it to make a mess. Yes, the world was introduced to your very own pet rock. And I'm disappointed because I dug mine out of the box that was in my office at home, set it on the kitchen counter, and I forgot to bring it with me this morning. <laughs> at least it didn't run away. It didn't run away, no. <laughs> but those of us who had pet rocks had their very own carrying case for their little personalized rock, complete with air holes that so it could breathe, and it was swaddled by this little pile of hay for comfort. It even came with a handy dandy 32 page training manual of how to take care and train your pet rock. I know you're laughing, but it's true. <laughs> there were ideas like how to house train your pet rock. Put your pet rock on some old newspaper. The rock will never know what the paper is for and will require no further instruction. That was actually in the manual. It even provided ideas on training your prep rock to sit, play, play dead, and attack on command. Although the last one did require assistance from the owner. <laughs> <laughs> you were set for life with your very own self-contained pet. Now, if we had thought about that 42 years ago, we would have been millionaires. So going back 42 years, and I mean, I really laugh, a pet rock, now yeah, really, I mean, who would have thought that a shiny rock would be the craze of the 70s and part of the 80s? 
And all this rock did was just sit there. Mine sat at my desk at the church. It just sat there. Now in today's society, we are more, far more advanced. So check this out, a pret rock for the 21st century. It comes with its very own USB cord, and you can plug it in, and this baby fits right into your PC or your Mac. It even plugs into the lighter adapter or the USB outlet in your car. And you know what this rock does when it's plugged in? Nothing. Absolutely nothing, right. <laughs> Apparently this rock just has a USB cord and is still just <laughs> a rock. I thought you'd like that this morning. A more expensive, I think. It's you know, you know, modern century, you know, you know, I don't even know how much they were back in the day. So um, how many, however, for many of us, sometimes the word alive means dead. But that's not true. Sometimes that what's sometimes that once was dead was once was alive, and that the opposite of alive, of alive is lifeless. For example, that rock was lifeless and still is lifeless sitting on my kitchen counter this morning. It has never been alive and it never will be alive. And it'll never be alive outside any act that God does. So therefore, while many of us forget in our real lives, God actually can take lifeless rocks and turn them into living stones. A community of people who are active in the world building God's spiritual house, one rock or one block at a time. We heard this morning in 1 Peter that Christ comes, when we come to Christ, excuse me, a living stone rejected by mortals, but approved nonetheless, chosen and previously in God's eyes, and that you are living stones as well, and you are being built as an edifice of spirit to become a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifice to God through Jesus Christ. So it wasn't really Peter who invented the idea of Christ being a stone, if we dig through scripture, actually going all the way back to Genesis, um, we see different reflections. If you go back to Genesis, like in chapter 49, it makes reference of the shepherd and the rock of Israel. If you search a little bit further into Zechariah, like Zechariah 10, God promises to replace the leaders who don't take care of his people with a cornerstone from Judah who will lead the people in overcoming the enemy. And by the first century, the, the Qumran Jewish community had applied cornerstone and rock Im imagery in regards to the Messiah. Even Jesus himself and the imagery of G Jesus is introduced through that image, imagery, can't get that word out for some reason this morning, in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Not so much John, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So going a little bit further in, if I, if I go into Psalms, Psalms 118 makes the comment, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. God has done this, and it's marvelous in our eyes. So if we were to explore the New Testament in, and in John's gospel, we hear John described, we hear Jesus describe, described, we hear Jesus describe himself as the living water and the living bread of heaven. I was going to use the John passage this morning, but I kind of liked the Peter passage more better. Those were the two options this morning. But a living water and a living bread from heaven, it only makes sense that Christ will not be only a stone, but a living stone. So Christ is a living stone, and those people who come to Christ are also living stones which means is our identities come from our connection through Christ, and we are living stones because Christ, Christ is actually that living stone. Now, rocks aren't supposed to be alive, but through that encounter with Christ, the impossible happens. Sort of like turning water into wine. Through the encounter with Christ, the lame walked. Through an encounter with Christ, the blind saw. Through an encounter with Christ, 
the dead lived. Through an encounter with Christ, lifeless rocks become living, precious stones. You know, rocks, office, rocks awfully, often get that bum rap. You know, we go into the diamond mines. Before that, before that diamond is a diamond, what is it? It's a rock. That's why they call it a rock. You know, 20 karat rock on someone's finger. You know? When there are no good choices, Sometimes we say we're caught between a rock and a hard place. If you make lots of bad decisions or add two and two together and get three, people might say, you're dumb as a box of rocks. I, know, I thought two and two added to three, but all right, you know. When you do something that could upset everything and get people in trouble, we call it rocking the boat. When life gets worse and we can't get any better, we call it hitting rock bottom. See, there's lots of rocks in our life. Christ being the original living stone was rejected by human beings, believe it or not. And not just any human beings, the people of God were the ones who rejected him. So it should be no surprise then we are rejected just like the rest. So if we go back into John's gospel a little bit, we are reminded, do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the, if the world hates you, but then we hear Jesus say, remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If, the, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you too. So as a living stone, we need to expect to be rejected in our lives sometimes. The world will think that you're not good enough for them, when the truth is through Christ that you're too good for them, there's lots of things that come with being that rock of Christ. But we are also blessed that God has different standards in the world for different things. One day a rock collector was out walking and he passed a pile of worthless rocks. He picked one up and examined it and says, I can make something out of this. He took it home and polished it until it shone bright and shiny. Then he put it on display with his precious stones, his emeralds, his rubies, his diamonds, and his sapphires. That's what God does for us. When we are like that worthless rock, God says, I can make something out of this. And what he does is he chooses us and he transforms us into something precious. We become that precious living stone that God counts on amongst all of those special treasures amongst God's love. So each of us sitting here this morning is a precious stone. You can identify whichever stone you'd like. I like emeralds. They seem to be a little bit more marketable than diamonds, but happens to be my first stone. But, um, but we're all those precious stones in our lives. We're not just some rock sitting there dumped in the dirt, cluttered with some mud or all that, where that polished rock, and I wish I would have brought the pet rock this morning because it's so, it was polished and pretty and had the little eyes on them and all that, but regardless, God has a purpose in mind for each of us. And that purpose is far greater than the sum that we even think about as individuals because the whole of this part, this whole matter of all of this is that all those parts of the rocks, when they come together, they build that stone wall that is sturdy and strong. Ancient Sparta, if anyone is a history buff, was a city famous for its wall. One day, a visiting dignitary came to Sparta, and Sparta's king showed him around the city. The dignitary saw Sparta's temple, the theater, and the sculptures, but looking around, he didn't see any great wall. Finally, he asked the king, where is this Sparta's great wall? I have heard of it and wanted to see it. So the king of Sparta said to his guest, excuse me, so the king said to his guest and to the Spartan and told the Spartan army that the king wants to show the wall. So the king opened his arms wide and said, 
This is the great wall. Referring to his army. Every man was a brick. That was the wall. It wasn't this wall that we think of, it was the wall of the army. So if we look a little bit further going into scripture, we hear and we see in Isaiah that I, say, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one that relieves, that relies on the wall will never be dismayed. I will make justice by measuring lines and righteousness to plumb that line. All different kinds of rocks, different types of images of rocks in our lives, all the way back to the beginning of time. So not getting off track and going back to our friend Peter this morning in scripture, God is building him a house. His lasting legacy, the place where all will dwell forever. And after laying down that foundation and the foundation of Jesus, Christ uses us and the rest of the people as the bricks in the walls of this home. The house is called God's house. It will be marked by unity, integrity, justice, and righteousness. And only God can build a house like that, as we know, and it only can take the people that are like you and me. It takes us to put that house together to make it beautiful. When a component of that breaks, then it's not God's house. When we have a competent mason who builds a wall, the stones that he uses are placed to stay. The stones are used to be placed in a way that they won't move or they won't be removed from the wall because they become that strength. It becomes that surface or that sacrifice of the wall's integrity. Folks, we are that community living as stones. And we must support one another to make the wall stronger than it ever is. God uses us each individually as that stone to build that house and to build the places that one precisely needs to have in their life. If we take one stone away, there's a hole. If we take many stones away, we don't have a wall anymore. It's not up to which stone gets chosen and gets to be placed where because we should all take regard that wherever the stone is placed, God has chosen where that stone goes. We as individuals, some of us may be friends, some of us may not be friends, but we're one body. We're one body in Christ together. When we take one stone away from that body, it affects all of us. If something happens to Julia, it affects all of us in our lives because Julia's a part of our family. If something happens to <clears throat> Ken, same thing, it happens to our family. If anybody, if something, if someone, if you get pulled away from that wall, believe it or not, it indirectly affects us as the wall because we are that church body and that church family. Just keep that in the back of your head. Have you ever read a story that you wish you could just reach inside that page and slap around one of those characters saying, you know, why aren't you doing it this way? I know I have a few times I've read a few, few nonfiction books. It's like, ugh, why did I even read this? But in order for God's house to be marked by that unity, that integrity, that justice and that righteousness, we have to be the people who actively seek that unity integrity, justice, and righteousness, but together. This is what, real, what it really means to be the living stones. In other words, we are not God's pet rocks that just sit there lifelessly and do nothing. 
We're not that gimmick or that cute idea that Gary Dahl created back 42 years ago. And we're not even the latest fad fashion where we are designated to just sit on a shelf and do nothing. Remember, pet rocks just sit. And those of God who are living stones are designed to be active in the world. We don't even have to have the latest and greatest pet rock with a USB port. Though it might be interesting to see, you know. But we don't need the fancy attachments. We don't need the gifts. We don't need all those other things to be that living rock in our lives. But we need to be that living rock to build and to grow in our own lives first and then in the lives of others. And to be that wall that continues to build and to be that strength. In a few weeks, we're going to start a new series for uh, Pride Month. Um, it's called Living Life Proud. And... Um, I think it'll be a great series, but part of that is being that wall, being those stones <clears throat> that have turned into the polished, fine stones coming together and building that strong wall together. Think about it. Do you know how diamonds are made? Diamonds are kind of a rock or a coal. It's not, it's a, it's a strong stone, but when it's polished through the heat and all that, it goes from a black figure to this shiny, clear, glass, precious stone. That's how we are in God's image. God creates and molds us to be that precious stone, whether it's the diamond or the emerald or the sapphire, whatever stone you want to pick. We're all those precious stones, and we're molded. And when you bring all of those stones together, it becomes the strength. You know, they say diamonds cut through glass. You know? A lot of other precious stones cut through glass too, but that's the strength that God gives us in our lives to be that living, that living stone. So the next time you want to be that pet rock in life and be on that shelf, maybe think again and be that living stone that you were created to be, to be that strength in that wall. Amen? Amen. Amen.